Hello, back at it again after a several year delay. Um, lots happened to me. I've now lived in two different houses since I've put in the last video or uploaded the last video. My last house I was in, I had two roommates and my gaming space was in the basement next to a heater and, and washer and dryer. And so there, there wasn't a lot of quiet time to record. It was, it was fairly busy all the time in the basement. So never really did any recording there. Uh, but now my wife and I live in our own house, and I have my own room. That's a very nice luxury, my own wargaming room. Uh, so yeah, I'm doing that now. I built a new computer during the quarantine period, so I'm able to actually record videos. The old MacBook Pro that's now 10 years old just was uh, getting too long in the tooth to do this kind of work. And now I have a nice, new, shiny computer, and uh, I can do that. So that's what we're going to do. Figured, you know, all, during the quarantine, I, I, I busted out Fire in the Lake. I hadn't played games in a while. I mean, I've been doing other things. Life gets you pretty busy. Um, but I did manage to put this out because I had a little extra time, as I think many of us did. And uh, playing on the table just made me realize how much I really enjoy the counterinsurgency system. And now that I have this snazzy new computer, a snazzy new ability to record and do all that fun stuff, I figure, hey, let's play a vassal game of Fire in the Lake. All right, this is about the insurgency in Vietnam. If you're not familiar, this is volume four of the Coin series. That is a series of games that GMT makes, right? Uh, you can see it all here. Uh, this one was, I mean, the series was designed by Volko Runke, who did Andean Abyss. That was the very first one. That was about insurgency in Colombia, involving the, the FARC and the AUK and the, the cartels and the government. Uh, really a watershed design. It's really, the, the Coin series is just really taken off. Uh, you, you know, when I, I helped play test Andean Abyss, and there's no way you could have thought, oh man, this is going to be the next hottest thing. But it, it pretty much has become a hot, hot design series. I don't even know what they're up to, like volume 10 or something. There's a lot going on. Um, I love it. I think it's great. And this one in particular, I really enjoy as well. This was done with Mark Herman. Obviously, a lot of uh, war gamers know Mark Herman's name. Um, this was his kind of entry into the coin series. And I think it was appropriate that he did Vietnam. I think it's a really, you know, great design. And that's what we're going to play today. So let's go ahead and take a look. I'll give a brief overview of what's going on. Uh, unfortunately, because this board is like really long wise, it's impossible to fit into one screen. So we'll be doing a lot of scrolling up and down. I'll try not to make it too much movement. Obviously, I'd like to be a little more smooth about it, but um, that's just kind of the nature of this game. Like we're just not gonna be able to get the entire map. I mean, I could get the entire map on, the, but it would just be really tiny. And there are times where we'll, we'll zoom out and take a look, but let's try to keep it, you know, big enough for your screen to see. If you haven't played the counterinsurgency games, generally the shtick of these is that you have a four-player faction. This is not always true. There is what, uh, the, what was it? The Brian Train one. Oh, I'm looking at, oh, oh yeah, Colonial Twilight. That was a two-player game um, that had just two factions. That, that's one of the interesting ones. I know there's another one coming out that's just three players. I'm feeling really bad the name is escaping me because I helped play test that one too, and I think that's a great design, a real fun three-player design about the um, uh, the Finnish, I don't know if you call it the Civil War, the Finnish War, uh, like 1919. Um, again, apologies, I probably should know that one more since I did help play test it, but you know, it's going to be good. It's coming out soon. It's called All Bridges Burning. Boom. There we go. Uh, go check it out on the GMT page. I think it's really definitely worth a pre-order. Uh, it's it's definitely does a really interesting take on three player. Generally, though, the coin games do four player. You have different factions. Uh, you play as regulated through the a deck of cards that has various uh, interrupters at where you stop and kind of take a, take a snapshot of the board, and that's kind of where points are scored. And you see who wins or who's in a winning position. If not, you kind of do different things and you reset and you go on to the next round. Um, each card has the faction order on it. So we'll start with this one. Of course, it tells you at the top who goes in what order. As you can see here, we have our four factions in this game is the Arvin, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. That's the yellow red star. The red with the yellow star is gonna be the North Vietnamese Army. The green with the white star is going to be our uh, US forces. And then the blue with the, it looks like a yellow star. Yeah, maybe so. That's going to be the Viet Cong, the VC um, forces, yeah. So this is the this is our start. We're gonna do a full campaign game. I did not do the historic stuff, so we're gonna get events that kind of crop up all over the place. I kind of like doing that way. I'm sure some people are real more about following the history more closely. Uh, I just enjoy the way that random events kind of come up, and and it makes for more interesting play. I like randomness when I play these games. 
Uh, I am going to be playing solo. We're not going to be using the bots. Uh, I think the bots are really cool, and I do think they offer a, a great way to kind of get that, again, randomness if you don't want to sit there and kind of know you play against yourself. It is a really awesome way to do it. It, it I think if you're a new player to the series, the, you, the bots are a great way to learn how to begin playing each faction because sometimes you look at this and you're like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Like, what is this faction trying to accomplish? And the bots kind of have a an optimized plan, right? They kind of go for their victory conditions in like the path of least resistance uh, way, right? With a little bit of randomness thrown in because that's how you make it exciting when you have a flowchart kind of bot. Uh, I'm just going to be doing solo. We're just going to be making the best decisions we can for each faction. I don't. I find that's pretty easy to do in the coin games. You can play either with bots or to kind of play against yourself. This one is interesting because each faction gets a pivotal event. They have little like prerequisites on it. Um, so for like this one, we can only play if two plus cards are in the RBN leader box. These are like the coup rounds or like the, are the leaders that come up. Uh, the coup rounds are like the interrupters in the deck, but kind of where we do a snapshot of the board and see if anybody's winning and all that stuff. So we need to have two plus cards in the box, and then you can this becomes available to play. And you have to have, what is that, more NBA troops than U.S. troops on the map. Okay. So, like, the U.S. has linebacker two, and this one says play of two plus cards in the RVN box. Okay. And your support plus available is greater than 40. That's on this track up here. Right now, our support plus available is 38. What support is, is that we're trying to, as the U.S., we're trying to build support for the uh, South Viet Vietnamese government. Um, so we want to go into the provinces and we want to kind of take actions that help us build up the support there. As you can see, like, Fubon here is at passive support. Uh, Kanhoa is at passive support. You know, Saigon's at passive. I don't think anybody's actually at active support. I think everybody's either actively opposed or just passively supporting. And available is how many troops are available, right? So as we pull more troops out and we build up support, the goal of the U.S., of course, is to build up support, but then also get its troops out of the country. And that's how the U.S. is going to win. Uh, so, th yeah, the linebacker pivotal event here says, yeah, I got support plus available is greater than 40, and then you can do that card. Uh, we'll go over each one as we get closer to them being unlocked, but essentially that's the one little wrinkle this game brings into the coin series is that when you can unlock your pivotal event, it's a way to kind of trump another player in case they start, to, when it becomes advantageous for you to do that, right? And then this event kind of takes over and then you get to do it. And each one has their own little special effect. So that's kind of like the one little interesting wrinkle this game brings into it. Um, trying to think what else we want to do. We don't have to worry about US policy. That's for the non, that's for if you're doing the flow bot. We're not doing the flow bot. So it doesn't matter who's the president. We're always, we'll always be the president. And right now the game starts off. This is the leader right now. Uh, Duong Van Min. Uh, basically, it's going to be each Arvin train operation adds plus five bonus aid. Aid is really important. We'll go to the top and take a look at that. Aid right now is, I think, under this one, right? Yeah, aid and patronage. So, as we talked about this, the U.S.'s goal is to build support and pull out troops. If you are the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, you want coin control, which means you have more of your troops in an area than any other faction. That means you have control over it, nominal control. They want to build up their patronage network and increase their coin control. Right now our patronage is at 15. Uh, aid is something that during the snapshot part when we do a coup, it's it's basically like represents international funded funding that's coming into South Vietnam. So there's ways for us to abuse the aid and sort of siphon it into patronage and vice versa. And we kind of want to keep the aid up because the South Vietnam needs resources to fight its war. The U.S. basically gets to do a lot of stuff for free. And then if it wants to do additional stuff, it can spend some of the Arvin money. But essentially, that's what aid does. It's going to help us boost that. So we want to keep that up. Uh, North Vietnam, they want to have NVA plus bases. So they want NVA control. They want to have more of their troops in areas and start seizing control right now. And the way you count points is like you can see here that they control North Vietnam, but it's worth zero population points. It actually has population, but in terms of this game, you know, they don't need they don't get credit for having their own land. And you can see they have troops in Laos here, nothing in Cambodia, oh yeah, a little bit in Cambodia and the Parrot's Beak, but again, these are all zero value spaces. So this is just a place to build up. It doesn't really count in terms of your victory. They eventually want to build up their troop count or guerrilla count and start invading South Vietnam and taking over these provinces and, and grabbing population points. And they want to get infrastructure. They want to put their bases out. So that's how they get points. And they just need 19 total. Right now they're at what, four? So that means they have four four population and base points. I think it's all base points right now. Yeah, you can tell there's four bases out. So there's one, two, three, and four. Okay. 
The Viet Cong, they want to do, I think theirs is bases and opposition. Yeah, there we go. And they need to get 36. So they basically want to have, the same way the U.S. is trying to build support, the Viet Cong are trying to build opposition. So you can see here that in some of the places they start, like here in Quang, Quang Tin, Quang Yai, they have actively opposed. So that means it's times two the value, right? That's what the times two means. So it's times two, two, so it's four. This is worth four points for them having this in active oppose. And they also count their bases. They're trying to build infrastructure up too. Nominally, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese are allies. They kind of work together, although they are sort of frictional allies. There are ways in which the North Vietnamese can take advantage of, this, of the Viet Cong. And the Viet Cong, you know, wants to do their own things, and they want to have some of the same goals of, like, attacking U.S. troops, of reducing the Arvin presence in, in the countryside. But they are trying to win their own war, right? And I think as you learn more about the Vietnam conflict, you understand that the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese had pretty much different aims. I mean, they, they were aiming for some of the same things, but they had different ways of getting there and had different, you know, visions for how it should be done. Uh, so that's kind of represents that. And the other side of the coin, oh, sorry, no pun, no pun intended, but kind of, uh, the Arvin and the U.S. are nominal allies, but they, of course they want different things, you know. Arvin is not really interested in building up support necessarily that can be used to their own ends in building patronage. We'll talk about that. But um, essentially they just want control over the area. They just want to have more of their guys out places so that they can nominally say they have control over the provinces or the countryside. And they want to build up their own internal patronage network. The U.S. wants to actually build true support for the South Vietnamese state and then also pull its troops out, right? So they, they are allied in the sense that they don't want to have a bunch of Viet Cong or North Vietnamese in the game board, but they also have different aims for what victory means. And they will be kind of working together and fighting against each other in the same way that the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese will work together and fight against each other in their ultimate goals. So that's kind of the basic idea of what we're trying to do. There's lots of different forces. This game has a lot of different things. We'll just take a look at some pieces here. The Viet Cong are the most, I won't say, I hate to use the word basic, but we'll say maybe the most simplistic faction. They only have bases or gorillas, these little octagon cubes. I think they're octagons, one, two, three, four. No, they're like hexagons, aren't they? I want to say they're octagons, but I don't think that's true. Yeah, they look more hexagonal. Okay, so they have these things. They have either an, uh, what is it, uh, undetected and active side. So if I flip one here, mark it active, right? Boom, okay, as a little star. That means that essentially they're known, their presence is known, they can be targeted and eliminated. Um, when they're upside down, there's no star. That means they're kind of hidden. That means they're there, but nobody really knows what they're at. It's all sort of representational of like, like the U.S. knows that there's guerrilla forces here in Quang Tri, but they just don't really know where it's at, right? Technically, when it's like this. When it becomes active, then they're like, oh, yeah, well, we actually know where that guerrilla force is or maybe their base of support or whatever. It's all very abstract, right? They have guerrilla forces and they have bases. That's their two thing. Okay. North Vietnam has guerrillas as well. But they also have access to troops, and that's going to be the cubes. And cubes can be troops or police, but they don't have police. They just have straight-up troops. Uh, troops can always be seen. Whenever you see them, people know where they're at because they represent like larger gatherings of, well, concentration of, of men and material, men and women, honestly, and material. And uh, they can be targeted much more easily than gorillas that are hidden. Okay, Gorillas stay hidden, but they don't have as much, usually, offensive punch. Troops have a little bit more offensive punch. Okay. The U.S. has troops, the green cubes, and they also have access to the U.S.-led irregulars. These are essentially special forces teams that either are represented directly by U.S. forces or maybe forces that they've helped train and lead um, that happened in the actual Vietnamese conflict. They operate just like guerrillas for the other side. They can stay hidden and they become active. They tend to have a lot more offensive punch, but they have very limited av availability to use that punch but that they are helpful. And the troops cubes are just, you know, represent the troops, you know, armies, marine, all sorts of good stuff. The Arvin have two different kind of cubes. The yellow are troops, same kind of thing. They're not as effective as the U.S. troops, but they are still troops. They can still do some nice combat moves. And then the yellow are the, or the orange, not yellow, are police. And police are important for maintaining your presence in a in a province because as we'll see when you have a a uh, like a coup round or a snapshot round 
then the police get to stay where they're at, but troops always have to like move back to a city or, or back to a base. And right now, the only, I don't think they even have... No, they do. No, they only have one base available right now. Uh, and they don't have one on the map. So basically, they have to always go back to the cities. Okay, the troops do. The police get to stay wherever they go. The police don't have as much offensive capability, but they do allow you to put, build your presence, your coin control presence. And they can do certain things that help you build up support. All right, so the U.S. definitely wants to kind of have police in the area they like police police are essential for getting the support built up and um yeah they're they're good and plus they have a mix here so you're going to be building both uh, yeah it's good to know the u.s has bases i think everybody has bases of little things these help you basically build troops part of your action you you take troops or cubes to build them and then as you have them down they help you build more or in the case of gorillas one of your actions is either like put more gorillas down with a base or you can actually flip all your active gorillas to underground if you have a base present. One thing that the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese get access to through special events uh, on the cards is tunnel bases. And these are just harder to remove. They essentially, normally the only way to remove a base is to get rid of all the gorillas in that area and then you can attack the base and kill it. It's always the last thing removed, right? With a tunnel, though, it's like you roll a die and 50% of the time you remove it and 50% of the time you don't. It sounds easy, but it's not. <laughs> it becomes very difficult sometimes to remove a tunneled base. Um, and that just represents the fact that they are tunnels. They're just underground networks. That was pretty much a, another hallmark of the Vietnamese conflict. The Viet Cong had a bunch of tunneled bases, so did the NVA. They're not easy to, to, to destroy or, or root people out of. But you can only get those through special events. You can't just build a tunneled base. And that's to come through the card play, okay? I've already done the deck here. It's a full deck. We have our first two events up. We have the current event and the upcoming event. So the current event here is, what is this? Chinook. Probably not saying that right at all. Uh, if you've watched my videos, you know that my pronunciation is not always great. So apologies. You can see there's two kinds of events here. Usually the top part that's not shaded. That's what they call the unshaded side. That usually is much better for the... U.S. and Arvin forces, and then the shaded part is usually better for the VC or the NVA forces. If you've never played the coin games, the way it works is the cards dictate the flow and events, right? So this first one comes up, the, this is the play order. See at the top there, we kind of got the, the Arvin's going to go first, then the, Viet, or then the North Vietnamese can go, then the U.S. can go, and then the Viet Cong can go. All of that is determined by down this, the sequence of play down here. So in that first card, we know the Arvin's going to get to go first. They can choose any one of these boxes or pass. If they pass, they get plus three resources because they're Arvin, and they remain eligible next round. Uh, we'll get into that in just a second. But otherwise, they can do something like take an op only and not a special activity. All right, so we have these little cards that let you that tell you what these are, right? Ops are just these kind of activities. Here, we'll slide over. Oh, get down. There we go. These are different like ops you can do, and these are the special activities. Every faction has like four ops. Some of them are the same between factions, and then they have three special activities that let them do special things. If you choose to do an op with no special activity, then you can do a full op anywhere you want given the restrictions here, but you don't get to do any of that. Now, why would you pick that? Why would you, or say, why would you do that? Why would you do first faction, op only, no special activity? Because once I put my cylinder here, Whoever goes next on the card order has to take the next box. They have to go there or they can pass. That's two options, either take the next box or pass. In this case, a second faction can do a limited op. A limited op is the same thing. You get all the same little ops available, but it's limited, so you can only pick one space. You can't do multiple spaces. A lot of these, you can, if you have the resources to pay for it, you can do it multiple times. A limited op or lim op, you can only do one, one space. Okay, So that's sometimes why you don't pick a special activity, because you want to limit what your opponent can do, right? Okay. If you choose this one, first op plus special, okay, now you get the full palette. You can do an operation and you can do a special activity, right? So that's nice. It's like a one-two punch. But the downside is, is that again, the second faction can either do a limited op just like this one, or they can choose the event. And sometimes you don't want them to pick the event because <laughs> the event would be very bad for you, uh, in which case you're going to want to do that. So that way they don't have the choice of picking the event. But sometimes you want to pick the event. Boom. Event. That means the second faction now can either can do a full op and they can add a special activity. So it's like a flip of this one, right? But they don't, they're not limited anymore. They get to do whatever they want. 
So the whole pull of this game is deciding what is the best thing to do. Should you pass? Because maybe this one's not a good event, but you come up high event on the next card. You can always see the upcoming card. Maybe you like the event on the upcoming card, so you just want to grab it. Um, sometimes you just need resources. So you pass to get a resource. It's really lame, but sometimes that's like the best move uh, is to just build resources. You just need them. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the choices. Uh, the events are different. Most of these are like one shots, you know, like this is a one shot thing. Sometimes you'll get a capability and that's like a, a game lasting effect. Like every faction has a capability. It'll change the rules for you a little bit and they last the entire game. Sometimes you get what they call momentum cards, which we can put here. And those last for like that round. So until you get like a coup card, which comes up, you get that special ability for that entire round. Um... Sometimes momentum cards are really good. If you can get it early on in the round, you think. Because the th one other thing about the coin games is this deck has been shuffled. And the coup cards have been inserted. Like, you make little separate decks, you shuffle those, and you stack those decks together. So you really don't know when the coup card's going to come up. It could come up the next card. It could be ten cards away. You just don't know. Every time you don't know. So sometimes you'll see a momentum card come up and you'll be like, this is really good, but it's really far into this, this round. I don't think I'm going to have it that long. You know, so maybe it's not worth taking. But sometimes it pops up right away. And then you're like, I'm taking that momentum because it's a great ability and I think I'm going to get like five or six actions maybe where I can use it. And we'll talk about that as we see it. So let's go ahead and just like jump into it. So we have here this event. So the Arvin's going to go first. Let's see what their event is. USR Arvin free sweep into or in any Cambodia spaces and then free assault in one. Mm, that's sort of helpful, but the Arvin doesn't have a lot of forces right now, and uh, the U.S. doesn't either. I mean, the U.S. has some things, but it this, this would have been more helpful later, but it's not helpful now. Let's see the Shaded event. It says the Viet Cong free rally in any Cambodia spaces. Okay. And then free march for any of those rally spaces. And then the NVA does the same. Okay, so that's not great. That's basically giving... Fr anytime, anytime you give your opponent free activities pretty bad like not a good thing you want them to spend resources in order to do things giving them free stuff is generally not great so i'm the arvin player i don't really want to have them take that event so i probably am not going to want to do something that gives them access to the event probably means i'm going to do this and honestly right now my main concern is the arvin player with the start of the game is i need to start getting more of my cubes out on the board Okay, so I'm going to be using a train op. Uh, train is the best way to build, is the only way, I think, to put guys on the board, unless it's an event. And then once they're on the board, we can start doing more stuff. But we need forces on the board to get control. Okay, so I'm okay with not having to do a special activity right now. That would be kind of nice sometimes. But honestly, that event's pretty nasty. And I don't want the second person in line, which is the NVA, to get that. Because I really don't want the NVA getting free marches and rallies. That's, that's just bad. That's bad, 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 bad. Okay, so let's do that. Boom, we're going to go here. We're going to do an op, no special activity. So again, I'm going to choose train. Uh, train says we can augment Arvin Force's support. We can do it in cities or provinces without NVA control. And right now, I don't think the NVA is anywhere in the country. I don't think they have any control in South Vietnam. No, they do not. So we're, we're pretty much, we can go anywhere as long as we have cities or provinces without NVA control. Okay, cool. Three, three resources per space where the Arvin is placed. So it costs us three resources per space we choose. If it's a city or U.S. Arvin base, I'm not going to say this every time. I'm just going to do it the first time so we can get a feel for it. If it's a city or U.S. Arvin base, okay, we can place one to two rangers. That's sort of our guerrilla forces. Or up to six Arvin cubes. If desired, in one train space, so in one of the places we choose, we can replace three of those cubes with an Arvin base. Or, the Arvin can, or if Arvin troops, police, and coin control... So if we have troops, police, and we control the province, so like uh, Saigon here, right? We have troops, troops, police, and we control it. We can pacify at one to two levels. That means we can increase the support. And that's three resources per level we do it in. Um, so you can see right here that we can train in any cities or provinces without NVA control, but it needs to be a city or a U.S. Arvin base. We don't have any Arvin bases anywhere. We do have a U.S. base in Saigon. I don't... Do they have another base? I think they do. Yeah, in Pleiku, they have a base. And that's it. So we either can rally any city, because NBA does not control them, 
or we can rally in Saigon or play coup. Because we want coin control, and coin control is like, you count the population points for coin control, you don't get to multiply it because we don't care about the support as much or opposition as much as the Arvin. We just want to hold on to territory as much as possible. The Mekong Delta here has like the most population. We have a two, we have a two, we have a two and a one. There's a two up here, but a lot of these are ones around us, you know. One, 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 ones, ones, there's a two, right? There's a two in the highlands, kind of the central highlands area, and then it's one and then a two. And then the cities are kind of bigger. But honestly, as the Arvin, we want to start just building up. So things I want to do, I want to go to my pieces. All right. I'm going to do that. These pawns, the white ones let you know that's an op, and then the black ones are special. And this is just how we do a little marker to help us know what's up. So I'm going to train in Saigon. I'm going to train in Kanto. I can do as many spaces as I want, as long as I can pay for it. That's the thing. Onlock is definitely vulnerable, but not totally right now. And I'm a little worried about the Highlands because the, the, the NVA has a good position here. But I'm also a little worried about Hue. Hue can, this area can get out of hand very quickly. I don't want to spend a ton of resources. I only have 30 right now, and I have no, I have no idea how long the round's going to go. So I want to make sure I don't just blow a ton of my resources. So I think I'm going to do that, and I'm going to go, mm, let's do Contum. I feel like helping the U.S. here root out the NBA or the, the Viet Cong is a good idea long term for us because the Highlands can be a difficult place to fight and, and win. And it's really annoying to have the NBA just build up here because they're difficult to root out. Okay, so we pick three spaces. That's going to cost us nine resources. Now, this, this module is pretty great. We could just go down here and be like, negative, negative, negative. Yeah, that's fine. I'm cool with that, but I can also do math in my head. So we'll just move it to 21. Okay. So we did, we spent nine resources. We have three spots. We can now put uh, either one to two rangers, which is not bad. Rangers are great because that's one of the special ops we have is called a raid and rangers are really good at that. But I really just want to get cubes on the board. I want to try to get as many of my guys out because sometimes when we get our coup round, we're going to get defectors or is it defections? Not defections. It's like a desertions. That's what it is. And they'll and some of our troops will disappear. Um, so we're going to we're going to want to get like as many of our pieces out as possible as quickly as possible. And we definitely kind of want to prefer troops, but we need police too. So let's do it. Let's take let's draw multiple of those. Let's do like three. Let's do three cubes here. Draw multiple. Let's do three. Actually, let's do four cubes here. And I'm going to move these guys up to Contum. Okay. That leaves us one more. We'll put one in Canto. Okay, so that's my three spaces. So I put three here. Let's do three police here. Yep, 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 yep. Three police. Let's put two police up top. Cool. And then we're going to put five. Oh, that leaves us. Yeah, because we only put one guy here. So we can put five more there. That's perfect. Okay. I'm going to take five and throw it over there. Okay. Canto. Boom. All right, hot. So we did that. We've got our event going. That's awesome. Uh, we don't want to end the. F we want to end faction plagues. This deletes pawns, clears movement trails, because that's all we can do. We don't get to do anything else. So we'll do that, and that cleans everything up for us. So nice. All right, who's next? All right, as we can see on our card, it's the red. It's gonna be the North Vietnamese Army. Okay, boom. They get to go. Now they only get to do a limited op, because we didn't let them get access to the event or do multiple or have the regular op they only get to pick one space and it's one of their operations so let's take a look at theirs real quick they can rally a lot of the insurgent factions have rally this just is like the same thing as we have it's just build up your troop presence they have march lets them move things attack lets them do stuff and terror is the way that they build up opposition okay and it also makes it more expensive later if you try to pacify because you know you, you have to basically convince people to forget all the bad things that have happened there uh we're gonna definitely do rally because it's the same thing it's early in the game i don't really want to move a bunch of stuff right now i'm not trying to attack and i'm not in a position really to execute a terror op uh, i just don't have anybody in the country 
I want to build up my presence. Now, the one thing about the North Vietnamese army is that you want to start building up, especially in Laos and Cambodia, because it's harder for the, the allied factions to get in there, the U.S. and Arvin. And as you can see, these places border a lot of other provinces, so it's easier to build up a presence here and then sort of shoot your troops or guerrillas into these areas. I like building up in the Parrot's Beak because not only do you get access to the Mekong Delta here, but eventually we want to get stuff into the fish hook. And I think the best way to do that is to build up our bases here because as we get more bases, we get better ability to build things. So let's take a look at this off real quick. It is any friendly forces and we can upgrade the trail. This is, of course, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This is how we, if we build this up, we get better capability to do stuff. It's really good to build up. Okay. We can choose any provinces or cities without support. Hot. So that's kind of nice. Any place that doesn't have support. Okay, so we can't go like Saigon. We can't go to like, uh, who else has support? Like we couldn't go to here, right? Because they have support. Okay. One resource per space plus two to improve the trail. Now, we only start off with 10 resources. We're pretty resource poor. So we need to be a little careful about our spaces, but we get resources during the coup rounds from the trail level. So we're going to want to keep the trail up. The U.S. can do bombing missions to knock the trail down. We want to keep it up. So we're probably going to do this. We can only pick one space because, again, it's limited up. So we can place one NVA gorilla, or we can replace two with an NVA base. If we have an NVA base, we may instead place NVA gorillas up to the trail value plus the bases. And then, if desired, we can then improve the trail. So, again, we're going to, we can improve it up to what? Trail value plus bases. The trail value now is one. Okay. We have one base here. So we're gonna rally here again. I'll throw out the pieces there to be cool. We're gonna cost one resource to do it, but we're actually gonna pay three right now because I am gonna improve the trail. So let's go ahead and move us down to seven. We're gonna get two gorillas, bomb, because the trail value is one and we have one base. Throw down here in the parrot's beak. And then because we paid the two extra, we're gonna improve the trail to two. So now when we do, if the U.S. doesn't degrade the trail, that is, we're going to get more gorillas when we put stuff out. It's great. Okay. Yeah, that's nice. That's real nice. Okay, so we've done that. We only got one op. We're going to end our faction play. So now we look down at the sequence of play. We filled up all the boxes. Now what we do is we take these guys. They've This is the only moves that can be made this turn. So we put these guys in eligible because they've done stuff. Great. We discard this. We can say, hey, discard it. It goes there, and we'll hit the draw card button, and it's going to move the next event over, draw another card down, and we can see the next event is Bob Hope. All right, so in this one, the Viet Cong get to go first, which sounds kind of funny for a card called Bob Hope. Then the U.S., and then the other two factions, doesn't matter. They already went, but if they somehow were eligible, they would be at the back of the line anyway. Okay. So let's look at the event here, uh, the non-shaded event. Move any U.S. troops from a province to a coin control city. Uh, provinces are the non-city spaces. These are provinces. Okay. And let's see, for each two moved, one casualty piece to available. So we don't have a lot of casualties. These That's what happens when like our troops, when the U.S. troops get attacked. I believe it's like one out of every three get moved to the casualties. Otherwise, they just go back to being like available casualties. You cannot bring back unless you have certain special events or rules like they are considered like really out of it so this is nice if this would come later in the game we would be able to get our troops back but so that's really not a good event like honestly that's not great for the u.s that's not an event we really want to use but they're not up first so let's look at the shaded event uh shows lower op okay slows <laughs> oh show lowers op tempo this is like the uso show so it's basically saying like oh everybody's distracted watching the show the NVA or VC can move up to three U.S. troops from any provinces to the city, so they can move the guys, and then place a gorilla where each troop was. Ooh, that's really good, honestly, because as the 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 as even though the NVA had ten resources, the poor <laughs> the poor VC only get five. Okay, so we really need to either find ways to improve our money, which we can do by taxing a province. That's one of our special abilities. Or we can use this to, to move troops out, which is there are some nasty troops around, and it would be nice to get rid of them. But if remember, if we choose the event, then the U.S., which is next, can do ops and specials. And they have some pretty potent good stuff. And, like, the U.S. doesn't have to spend money to do stuff. It pretty much is assumed to have infinite resources. We know that's not true, but essentially in this conflict it, it is. 
Mm, that's really interesting. I know the event is not that good for the U.S., so I'm not too worried about taking an op and special here because the event sucks for them, and I don't think they're going to want to use it. The event is good for me in a sense. I could move troops around, get free gorillas, so I could do, what, three troops? Is that what it said? Yeah, any provinces to cities. Cool. So I could just reposition their stuff. So that can be helpful. But I don't know if it's that helpful right now. So let's take a look at what, the, what would be available if we could do an op and special. So again, we have rally, we can march, we can attack, we have terror. Our special stuff is tax. In any four spaces, an underground BC gorilla and no coin control. We can activate a gorilla and then shift it one level to support because, of course, we're like taking money from the people there. And then we can add BC resources equal to the econ um, or twice the population. The econ value is when you're on a line of communication. It's these little roads that link things. They're worth values. That's like money. Um, some are zero. Some are one. I think there are a couple that are two. Is there anybody that's worth two? Yeah, the Mekong River here is worth two. Um, yeah, if we're on it, that's pretty great. It's a great way to get money is to put your guys on the on the roads and start doing that. We can subvert, which is taking over Arvin units. That can accompany... So the, the other thing about special activities is they can only accompany certain ops. So like tax can go with any op. Subvert can only go with rally, march, or terror. So you couldn't attack and then subvert. And then we have ambush that goes with march or attack. So you couldn't terror and then an ambush. It wouldn't work that way. Subvert lets us pick one or two spaces, each with an underground VC gorilla and any Arvin troops or police. And for each space, we can remove two Arvin cubes or replace one of those cubes with a gorilla. That's pretty hot. Minus one patronage per two Arvin pieces removed, round down. Okay, so if we take away a bunch of cubes, we get to reduce their patronage. This is one way the Viet Cong can fight the Arvin getting their victory condition. Or we can ambush. We can attack on the move and ensure success. Uh, location, one or two spaces where a VC gorilla who has marched or is about to attack is underground. And then you can do the attack procedure, except that you activate only uh, a sole gorilla. You remove one enemy. We don't have to roll. Usually attacks involve rolls. So you remove one enemy and no Viet Cong die. And if you're on an LOC, then the target an adjacent piece of desired. So if you're on one of these little roads, we can target, like if we were on this one, we could target here or here. Right. If we're on this route, we could target here or here. Marching usually costs you resources, but if you look at March, if the destination LOC or... Wait, which way is it? One resource per non-LOC destination, LOC's lines of communication are zero. So if you move to a province, usually it costs one or a city, but if you move to a road, it costs you nothing. So you can move to a road and ambush pretty much for free. And I think we can ambush in how many spaces? One or two spaces where we marched or are about to attack. So that's pretty hot too. This is tough. What I think I want to do is I want to start building up their their presence as well because we really don't have a ton. And we want to start building up in high population areas because we need money. So we want to start taxing. So I think we're going to do Oppa Special. We're going to rally and we're going to tax. That's what we're going to do here. So rally lets us do that. Tax, we can do it with any op. Okay. So let's pick some spaces and start rallying. Okay. I want to keep Tain in. I want to keep that. We have a tunnel base here. Let's keep it going. It's worth two. I like that. Ken Fung. I like that. I'm going to do that. So that's three spaces. We've, that's cost us three resources so far, so we can't spend a ton of money. But we want to do that. I honestly would like to build up in the highlands because it's harder to root us out in the highlands. Yeah. And there's a base here, and that's annoying. They're really good. The U.S. fights really well with a base in its area, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's put one there. So I've got four spaces selected, okay? So you can do either ops and specials in any way you want. You can do the special first, or you can do the op first if you want. Let's go ahead and just do the op first and special. We could do it in reverse, especially if we wanted to get more money first and then do a bunch of rallies. But right now I'm not trying to do crazy moves, so we'll just do the, the rally first. Okay, so how does rally work for these guys? Uh, it's one resource per space. We picked three, so we're going to go down three resources. We place one gorilla or replace two of the base. That's pretty much a standard formula in the coin games. If it's a VC base, we instead place gorillas up to the population plus the bases, or we can flip any VC gorillas there underground. So if we have a base, we can make them all hide again. Um, if not, we get to place it with the population plus the base value. Okay, cool, cool, 
super cool. And we can only target spaces that are without support. So it can't be anywhere that has support, okay? As you can see, none of the places we picked have support. We're gonna go down to two resources, okay? So here we have a base and there's one population, so we can put two gorillas there. Let's go ahead and do that. Just drag two over. Tainan, we have two population and a base, so we can put three. That's hot, so we'll do that. Uh, and then, oh, we did four space, so I gotta take one more. And then Ken Fong and Ken Gang, we don't have a base here, so we can only put one gorilla. Because if you have a base, you can do it, but if you don't have a base, yeah, replace one, and if we have a VC base. So we don't have a VC base, we can only place one guy there. So let's go ahead and take one more resource away. And then let's put a, one gorilla in each space. All right, so now we're gonna do our special op. Now, if you remember, we can pick up to four spaces, okay? So we're gonna pick, I think the same four. I think that's a smart play. So in each one of these places, we're gonna do that. And then we'll put one here as well. So what that lets us do is, we're going to tax, that lets us pick four. With underground BC and no coin control, so they can't have coin control in it, and other places do. Well, do they have coin control? They do not have coin control. Uh, in each space, activate a gorilla, shift at one level to active support, and add VC resources equal to econ or twice the pop. You know, honestly, we're not going to do that here in Play Coup because I don't want to give them any support. We're just going to do it in three spaces. I guess we could do it here. Yeah, we can do that here because we can pick any space. I think we can pick any space we want. Keep pulling that bar up. Up to four spaces. We just have to have VC and no, we just have to have underground and no coin control. Okay, hot. So in each place we're gonna activate a gorilla and we're gonna get twice uh, the population in resources. So this is one, we're gonna get two things and we shift it one towards support. So that goes down and we're gonna get two resources here and activate a gorilla here this is worth two, so we're gonna get four resources here. We shift it. This is worth two, we're gonna mark it active, we're gonna shift it, we're gonna mark it active, and we're gonna shift it. So we get four, eight, 12, 14 resources. All right, 14, so it's two, right? And then this is four, eight, 12. So we get 14 resources, that's pretty hot. So now we were at one, but now we're all the way up to 15. All right, and that leaves the U.S. coming up here. I'm going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to see what's up with the U.S. turn.